Hi, it's Glenn O'Neill. Today is August 23rd, 2021. This is episode three of A Close Look at San Filippo Syndrome. We're covering in 10 minutes, five topics in the world of San Filippo and some of the work we've been doing here at Cure San Filippo Foundation over the past couple of weeks. As a reminder, San Filippo Syndrome is a rapidly degenerative and fatal disease in children, currently with no cure or treatment options. So here we go. With kids going back to school, uh, this is a pretty timely topic. You know, nothing about this past year and a half has been normal uh, for, for children in school, let alone special needs children. Um, you know, this, this kind of topic started when my wife started seeing uh, things with my daughter Eliza and then hearing from other parents about, you know, the inadequacy of, of when schools close, trying to have these children with neurodegenerative diseases do virtual learning and and you know hearing things like oh we can make up those lessons later that doesn't work for a child who is is you know losses we, we can't have any loss um, you know it's a very difficult situation it's a challenge that we thought needed to be addressed and and discussed so my wife reached out to one of our frequent collaborators and neuropsychologist at the University of Minnesota dr. Julie Isengart about working together and trying to highlight this this issue and from there, the collaboration grew, and at University of Minnesota Neurodevelopment Rare Disease Program was involved, Project Alive, who works on MPS2, was involved, and the National MPS Society was also involved. What we all wanted to do was create uh, information about this in an op openly available publication. So this was done, and it's now available, and this highlights the, the hugely important role that educators and therapists play in supporting uh, neurocognitive function and quality of life of children with these types of diseases. It provides a resource for how educators and therapists can best serve these children during pandemic times and, and really during any times. I think it highlights the, these important concepts regarding the education in general. And we've been able to boil this down, this extensive publication, down into a white paper with key takeaways for educators and administrators who can begin implementing this immediately. So this white paper is also available, and our goal is to get it out there in the hands of as many special needs educators as possible. Uh, so please feel free to help us by downloading and sharing this white paper with the people that you know. And you can access this publication at curesff.org slash article3. We think this is really, really important, especially during these times. Speaking of my wife uh, and also a doctor and our chief science officer, she's here to join us. Kara O'Neill is here to join us. Uh, so thank you for joining us, our first uh, guest on our podcast. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I'm always excited to talk about the research that uh, Cure San Filippo and our donors are helping to support. There's some amazing science going on out there. Today, I will focus on a recent publication that came from some, some work that we've been supporting over the last few years with other collaborators. And this work has come out of the labs at the Telethon Institute in Italy. This work focused on really looking at the dopamine system in San Filippo and um, they included work on Hunter syndrome. And in both of these diseases, um, the children develop autism behaviors as well as progressive dementia symptoms. What they found in their research is that the changes in the dopamine pathway start even before birth in the animals. And this is really important because how the brain um, evolves and develops sets you up for a lifetime of um, differences potentially. And what we needed to understand was could these differences be impacted and at what points and what time frames. So let me just take a step back and what is dopamine and why do we care about it? Um, dopamine is a really important neurotransmitter that has effects in the body, in the digestive system, the immune system, your blood vessels, but it also has a very critical role in uh, behavior modification and also in how we move, how we walk, how we reach for things. And you may have heard about dopamine when people talk about Parkinson's disease or even ADHD and other mental health disorders. So it's a really critical neurotransmitter. Um, what the researchers found is when they impact a certain very specific part of this pathway that we are able to um, reverse and rescue some of those autism behavior symptoms like hyperactivity, repetitive movements, um, socialization, things like that. Um, we also know that later on, we see a reversal of that hyper dopamine um, 
type of setup that happens early in life in the San Filippo animals. Well, later in life, as neurodegeneration progresses, we see a loss of that. So what we need to understand in this next grant that Cure San Filippo donors have helped fund, along with our other collaborators at San Filippo Children's Foundation in Australia and San Filippo Fighters in Italy, um, on this next grant, they'll be looking more into that, looking at very specific drugs that will help impact that pathway with a reduced number of side effects that can happen. Um, and they'll also be looking at how the abnormal heparin sulfate that happens in San Filippo, how that impacts um, growth factor signaling and a variety of other mechanisms in San Filippo. So we're gonna learn a ton um, that will lead us hopefully to clinical trial. That's, that's the aim here. Um, and children. In children, oh, yes, great. yes, in children. So thanks for letting me share just a little bit about the research and I look forward to talking with you next time. Thank you so much, Kara, that's so exciting, so exciting. Next up, I wanna talk about the recent press release from one of the biotechs in the San Filippo space, Abiona Therapeutics. Uh, the title and the details of this press release were particularly exciting. Abiona announced that new MRI data showing increased brain volume in young patients with San Filippo syndrome type A after treatment with their gene therapy. As a reminder, this is a clinical trial that supporters of Cure San Filippo Foundation helped fund. It started back in 2016 and it continues here today, five years later. Uh, Abiona announced that MRI, MRI imaging data from this clinical trial study saw increased gray matter, corpus callosum, and amygdala volumes in the brain in three young patients with San Filippo syndrome. Um, the head of uh, R&D for Abiona was quoted and said, uh, brain volume loss is characteristic in children with MPS3A and is associated with long-term cognitive and physical disabilities. He went on to say, the new MRI data shows the potential of gene therapy to increase brain gray matter, corpus callosum, and amygdala volumes and is consistent with previously reported results of a preservation of neurocognitive development in these three young patients in the clinical trial. So this was specific for children that were treated at a very young age, under the age of two, I believe. Um, still, this is a huge breakthrough overall if these results continue and we await more information about you know, any type of path towards being able to discuss with the FDA uh, approval for this treatment so that many more children can have access to it. And again, it's because of foundation support that this trial was able to happen. And it's so exciting to hear these promising results. Um, you can read about this on abionatherapeutics.com and just look for uh, press releases and click on that. Next, I want to talk about how truly connected the world is becoming. I think we all know this, but you know, we're having families reach out to us now from all over the world, much more than before. They're finding information on the internet, on social media, through searches. And we are glad to hear from them, glad to talk with them, and glad to provide them information and support in any way possible. Uh, just in the past couple of weeks, we've had two families from Russia, uh, parents from France, Switzerland, Kenya, and Egypt uh, have all reached out. And what we do is we get on Zoom calls. Um, we just had several this past week, sometimes with interpreters, and we help them navigate the world of San Filippo syndrome and the landscape of San Filippo around the world. You know, these can be tough discussions, just like with the families uh, of, of here in the United States, but, but often even more so with these families that may be in a country where there aren't clinical trials happening. And, you know, the feeling is that the opportunities may not uh, be the same. So, you know, I, I'd say overall, uh, the one thing that we continue to hear when talking to these families and what they're looking for is, is hope, is some type of hope, um, you know, not a guarantee. They understand that. Uh, but a path to the possibility of helping their child and, and even if not their child, um, helping the next generation coming. So, uh, you know, that, that's why this is all important. It's, it's a reminder of the work that supporters help happen here at Cure San Filippo. You know, we envision an approved and effective treatment is a reality and it's available to everyone. You know, that's our goal. A day when we can have these calls with the parents and a newly diagnosed family and point them directly to something that can help, you know, no matter where they are around the world.
And finally, I'd like to end with some information about Courageous Parents Network uh, and a recent panel I participated in. Courageous Parents Network is an educational platform with incredible resources and support for parents going through the journey of having a child with a terminal illness. Um, I was on a panel called Being the Dad, which specifically focused on the journeys dads take. Uh, you know, often webinars and podcasts uh, focus on the mom's journey, uh, which for certain uh, moms are the best. Moms are number one and they are the greatest, but uh, the dads often take a different emotional path uh, that bears some exploring and some discussion about coping methods for dads. So I was really honored to be asked to be on this. The session was run by a PhD psychologist expert who focuses on fathers. And, you know, I was able to give my thoughts and I was joined by two other great uh, dad panelists who shared their experiences and perspectives. And also there was a Q&A and discussion section. And, you know, some of the attendees were dads who were even further down the road than, uh, than myself or the other panelists. And I found their words and what they presented and, and talked about really powerful and really particularly valuable for me. Um, so again, why is this important? You know, it's because as much as we are focused on research and we're focused on clinical trials and treatments, uh, we work closely and we forge friendships with the people, the parents, you know, there's so many moms and dads going down this road, this nearly impossible road. Um, so it's important to have resources like Courageous Parents Network to be able to point the parents towards so they can access, you know, this information no matter where they are on the journey from newly diagnosed to bereaved parents. So it's, these are tough, tough topics, but you know, I find the site incredibly helpful and I know many others do. You can check out the site at CourageousParentsNetwork.org and for the specific session on dads, you can search Being the Dad and you'll find it there. Well, that's our 10 minutes. We went a little over. Thank you again. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for helping make the world a better place. We will see you in a couple weeks. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.